seated. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. between the ages of five and nine, and you would like them to, to go to Children's Chapel, now is the time to, to go ahead and have them gather at the back door and um, we'll go off and worship together, and then they'll be brought back in uh, for the closing song. In other words, they're not just gone for the rest of the service. They will be back before we're done. So, Well, last Christmas, I'm not asking you to remember what we studied at Christmas, even though it's only been a few months. But we looked at a passage in Luke chapter 2 where Mary and Joseph presented Jesus in the temple, the dedication, uh, presumably on his eighth day. And while they were doing this, they, they met a man named Simeon and a prophetess named Anna. And... Both of them, Simeon and Anna, both recognized Jesus, this infant Jesus, as the one who would bring about the restoration of Israel. And they, they blessed him, but, but there's a particular statement that was made by Simeon in that passage that we didn't, we didn't really go into much depth on. We probably, in, in, to, for most of our, our memories, we kind of glossed over it. But it's a statement that he makes in Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. This is what, what Simeon said. He blessed them and he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, Today's message is not about that passage, but I do think it's, it's important to, to recognize that Simeon was indicating that Jesus' life and, and his presence here would be the focal point for conflict and division. That his life 
would be characterized by rejection. And the implication seems to be that if you love him and if you follow him, then your life could also become a point of conflict and division and rejection as well. So that's not exactly encouraging news right out of the gate. But, but it's really the beginning of this conflict that we're seeing in Luke chapter 4 that Mark just read for us. And as we look at this conflict that, that is, is beginning with Jesus as he is driven out into the wilderness and tempted, there are three things that I want us to, to take a look at and consider this morning as we look at the conflict. I want us to see the pervasiveness of the conflict. In other words, how broad-reaching it is. Then we'll look at the nature of the conflict. Where does the conflict come from? Where does it originate? And then thirdly, we'll look at the, at the solution for the conflict. So we'll look at the pervasiveness of it, the nature of it, and then the solution for it. And so we'll start, obviously, with the pervasiveness of this conflict that Jesus' life brings and attract, seems to attract. Notice that Jesus has just been baptized. This is the passage we looked at last week in Luke chapter 3, where the Holy Spirit has descended on Jesus. And Jesus has heard, as well as everyone else present for his baptism, also heard this voice audibly from heaven, from the Heavenly Father saying, you are my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And we're told right here at the beginning of this passage that he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then almost immediately, he is thrown, in, thrown under attack. The conflict comes. The temptation comes. Now, if you think about it, I, I think this is true. I, I think that generally speaking, it is human nature in general, and, it, and it's specifically reflective in our, our current culture, our modern era, that we tend to assume that if you live well, your life will go smoothly. We expect good things to happen to good people, right? So we, we, when th good things happen to us, we say things like this, well, I must be living right. Or when things don't go well, we we tend to draw other conclusions. It's what, it's what Job's friends did. You may be familiar with the story of Job from the Old Testament. And Job was a very godly man. But then all of a sudden, in his experience, and to the experience of those around him, all of a sudden, things started going terribly wrong in his life. His family was dying. All kinds of terrible things were happening to his home and to his property and to his crops and to his herds and flocks. And his friends say to him, Job, you know, it's pretty simple. There must be some horrible sin in your life. You need to repent. And if you repent, maybe all this stuff will stop happening to you. Because obviously all this stuff is happening to you because of some sin in your life. And if you repent, then perhaps God will stop torturing you. Because if good things happen to good people and things aren't going well for you, it must be because you have messed it up. That's kind of how we think. That's sort of reflexive for many of us, I think. Well, enter Jesus into the wilderness. He's filled with the Spirit. He's pleasing to the Father. He is without sin. And he's under attack. Think about it. Jesus himself said in John chapter 16, in this world you will have trouble. He didn't say, in this world you will have trouble, but with me it will all be easy. And it will all be smooth. What we see here is that even with Jesus, there's difficulty. In other words, 
in this life, in this world, we should expect difficulty. We should expect conflict. We should expect these kinds of struggles. You can expect that, that if Jesus was the center of a lot of these kind of struggles, then we who will follow him, our lives also may, may be at times seeming to be the center of some of these kinds of difficulties. But think about how, how broadly true this is. What happens to people who lie? Typically, their lies catch up with them, don't they? And their lies become their undoing. They bring them down. What happens to people who tell the truth? Sometimes, people who tell the truth get punished. Sometimes people who tell the truth lose the sale. Sometimes people who tell the truth lose the election. You see, it's not the case in our experience as we live this life that those who live well, for whom those who live well, everything goes smoothly. It's just not the case. Life is full of conflict, it's full of struggle, it's full of difficulty, even for Jesus and even for those who follow him, even for us. Why am I making such a big deal about this? I'm making a big deal about this because we believe, perhaps more than any other time in history, that life is supposed to go smoothly. We spend a lot of our time and a lot of our effort, a lot of our money trying to build around ourselves this kind of protection and hedge to make sure that life goes easily. And as a result, if you think about it, we have twice the pain. What do I mean by that? Well, we suffer the pain itself. That's that's the first pain. When things happen, when things get hard, we we suffer that pain. But then we also suffer the shock over the fact that something difficult is happening at all. Think of of this kind of example. Let's say you have a car accident. I'm not hoping that for any of you. But let's say you have a car accident and, and perhaps you're injured in the car accident. And your car is damaged. And you have financial ramifications for this car accident. Okay, that's the pain itself. But then the second pain comes when on top of that we say, I can't believe this happened to me. Things like this aren't supposed to happen to me. I mean, I have God in my life. I mean, I follow Jesus. I'm trying to live a good life. Things like this aren't supposed to happen to me. And so you have the pain itself, but then you have the second wave of pain because this isn't supposed to happen, and I don't know what to do with this. And so what do we do next? we got to figure out who to blame, and we got to figure out who's going to pay. So not only do we feel twice the pain, but then it turns us into something that we don't really want to be vindictive. Why do we do this? In part, I'm suggesting it's because we haven't settled in our mind that life has conflict, that life is full of difficulty, that there is struggle, even life with God. Settle it. Settle it. It's a given in this life. It's pervasive. None of us are protected from it. Jesus wasn't protected from it. The second thing that we need to see or look at is is the nature of the conflict. The conflict is spiritual. The origin of the conflict is spiritual. The passages that we're looking at is showing us that there is an evil spiritual reality. Even that there is an evil spiritual being 
called the devil or Satan. Now, I know that some people in, in our modern times don't believe in a spiritual reality like this, let alone an evil spiritual reality. Only superstitious people, only, only naive people believe this kind of stuff. That's what we'll often hear in the world in which we live. But I would suggest to you that if you don't believe in an evil spiritual reality, then you're actually not well prepared to make sense of life in this world. You'll have difficulty making sense out of much of this life. Back in the late 1930s, maybe into the early 40s, there were, there were a lot of people, leaders in, in the world and leaders in our country, who were hearing reports from Germany of atrocities that were being committed, particularly against Jewish people. And the leaders, when they heard these reports, they, they couldn't believe it. In fact, they didn't believe it. Among them was current president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Because that was the beginning, sort of the beginning of the era where, where it was believed that education and culture and science, those, those were the things that were the remedy for difficulties in the world. That was going to be the solution for all the things that were bad in the world. And if you think about it, the Germans were among the most educated. They were, the, they were among the most enlightened in, in all of, of the Western world. And so there was, there was no way that these kinds of things that were being reported could be happening among the German people. So they didn't believe it. Even when the evidence started to, to be manifest, people like FDR had no way to process or understand how these things could possibly be happening. But FDR began to read a Christian philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. And while he read Kierkegaard, one of the things that he encountered was Kierkegaard's Christian understanding of evil, of the spiritual reality of evil. And it wasn't until after he began to, to process some of what Kierkegaard was saying that he began to understand the Christian view of evil. And it wasn't until then that, that FDR was, was able to begin to have a category to process what was happening in Nazi Germany. The Bible teaches us, and, and we're, we're being confronted with it right here in this passage of Scripture, that the conflict that overarches all of life is a conflict between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. It's real. And it's spiritual. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan is, is the, the essence, it's the, the nature of this conflict and the way that this conflict shows up in Jesus' life, in Jesus' experience right here in, in Luke chapter 4, is over the issue of loyalty to his heavenly Father. Will Jesus be loyal to the kingdom of his Father, the kingdom of God? Jesus was the eternal Son of God. He had glory. He had power. He had authority. But in order to come and redeem a lost world, He had to take that power and that glory and that authority and set it aside. That's what we read in our call to worship from Philippians chapter 2. Though He was... In very nature, God, he did not consider equality with God something to be held firmly to. But he let it go. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant and being born in the likeness 
of a human like us. So, so let's look quickly at, at the different temptations that he goes, goes through and see how this loyalty is being tested, how, how this temptation is really about his devotion to his heavenly Father. The first temptation, Satan says, Jesus, turn this stone into bread. In other words, he's saying, use your power. Use your power for you. Use your power the way that anyone else who had your power would use it. We, we do this all the time, don't we? We, you know, we, we have icebreakers. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but we have icebreakers. You're in a group of people, and you're just trying to enjoy yourselves and get to know each other a little bit, and they say, okay, if you had a superpower, what would it be? And why, right? And so we, we go around the room, we share what we, if we could have a superpower, what would we want it to be and Why? And we say, well, I would, I would do this because then I could rule the world or I could do this and then I would make sure that everything was good for my family or I could make more money or I could whatever. That's the temptation for Satan. He's saying that from Satan to Jesus, he says, use your power the way that other people would use your power if they had it. Use your power for yourself. In other words, forget your father and his plan. You have power. Use it. Use it for yourself. Then there's the second temptation. Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, you don't have to go to the cross. That's your father's idea. That's your father's plan. You don't have to go to the cross. Just worship me. And I'll give you all of those kingdoms. You can, have, you can have this. You can have this kind of glory without going to the cross. Just ask me. I'll give it to you. And the third temptation, he takes Jesus up to the top of the temple. And he says, throw yourself down. And when your father sends the angels, his angels, to deliver you, everyone will see your glory. And you'll be glorified. In other words, you can have glory again without the cross. You can have, you can have these good things. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to you having glory, Jesus. I'm not opposed to you having power. I'm just telling you, I can give you those things. And you don't need God. You don't need your Father. You don't need His plans. You don't need to follow Him. All you have to do is bow down to me. Trust me. Serve me. And you can have it all. Taken together, these temptations are basically saying this. You can have glory without the cost. And you can have everything you want without God. Do you see the pattern? The pattern is that in the kingdom of Satan, the pattern is your life to serve me. Whereas in the kingdom of God, the pattern is my life to serve you. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came saying, my life to serve you. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Satan's saying, you don't have to do that. You can have it the other way. You can say, you to serve me. Jesus said, no. Jesus came to redeem a lost world by dying to pay for sin. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he refused to use his power for anything other than that mission. That's what he did. What this is showing us in a sense, is that every decision that we make, no matter how big or how small, moves us closer to one side of this conflict or the other. Whether it's as small as what kind of bread you eat to who you worship. It's a struggle. It's a conflict between two kingdoms and I want you to notice it's a, it's a conflict and a struggle over your heart. 
It's a battle for our heart. Do you catch this? That your heart is the prize in this conflict. Just as in, in, the, in the temptation of Jesus, it was Jesus' heart that was the prize for the conflict. Satan was trying to win Jesus' heart. He shows Jesus all these things that Jesus wants, and he says, you can have it without the cost, without the suffering. Just serve me. Just give me your heart. And the same is true of us. The conflict, the struggle, the battle is for your heart over what you and I will give our loyalty to. So what's the solution? The solution is to understand that Jesus is both our example and our substitute. He is both our hero and our champion. He's our example and our champion. Notice that in verse 5, Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth. In other words, he's seeking to capture Jesus' imagination with a vision of glory and power. And then what he does is he's basically trying to entice Jesus to want that glory and power with or without God. It's almost like he says, you know, if you can have these things with God, that's fine. But aren't these things worth having even if you can have them without God? That's what Satan does. That's, that's, that's his, his modus operandi. He takes good things and he tries to get us to make them ultimate things. So that we will want them even without God himself. Do you recognize that that pattern is present in the world all around us? It is. We're surrounded by it. We're, we're living in it almost to the point that we probably don't even recognize it half the time. Because we're so familiar with it. For example, take money. Money's a good thing, right? Everybody needs money. Now, bondage to money is the root of all evil. But money itself is not inherently evil. Money can be good. We're, we're entrusted with money. We're called to be good stewards of money. Everybody needs money. Well, if everyone needs money and money is good, well, then why does it really matter how you get it? That's what the world says. The world says, well, here's a good thing. You need it. So why does it really matter how you get it? You don't have to pursue the, the, the acquisition of money by following God's ways. It's good to have. You need it, so just get it any way you can, even without God. How about sex? Sex is a good thing. Okay, I'm telling you that. Sex is a good thing. God created it. But if it's a good thing... And God created us with natural desires for it, then why does it really matter how we get it? Why, why do we really need marriage? I mean, if it's a good thing and, and you want it, you value it, then why not just get it any way you can? You don't have to do it God's way. You don't have to follow God's teaching about sex and intimacy. You don't need his structures, his institutions. Just go get a good thing. How about power and influence? Power and influence can be good things. You can't shape the world without them, right? You can't change the world without power. You're not going to impact other people without influence. So power and influence are important. So just take them. Just seek them any way you can get them. You don't, you don't have to pursue power and influence by following God's ways of relating to power and influence. Just, just take it. Just get it. 
What's important is that you use it, that you have it. Not that you follow God's way of relating to it. Do you recognize this? That's what's put in front of us all the time. These things are pretty good things. So just take them. Just get them. And if you can get them with God, that's fine. But even if without God, go for it. Satan's ultimate strategy is to try to get us to see God as a means to an end. Here's all these good things. You know what God's purpose is? God's purpose is to help you get them. And if he can't help you get them, then who needs him? He holds up these things so that we would desire them. And he's trying to persuade us that either God is the obstacle, he's keeping you, he's what's standing between you and that thing that you want, or that you maybe even think you need, or at very least he's trying to get you to seek it without him. So that God is either your enemy or at least he's unnecessary. You see, in all these instances, he's trying to get us to love the things that we want more than we love God himself. Ultimately, it's always an issue of the heart. It's idolatry. This is why Jesus responds by saying, worship the Lord your God and him only. See, Jesus sees right through it. He sees what Satan's temptation is. He sees that Satan is trying to say, love these things, love these powers, love the glory. You want the glory, right? You're entitled to the glory. I'll give you the glory without any need for this other stuff that God is trying to get you to do. You can just have it easy. He says, no other gods. No other gods before me. So as our example, Jesus shows us what it looks like to love and trust God supremely, right? Jesus gave the right answers. He took the right stand. Jesus passed the test. So as our example, we can look at him and we can see what it looks like, how to do it, right? If Jesus can do it, we can do it. Amen? All right, let me know how it goes. Good luck. This is why we so desperately need the second half of this point. He is not just our example. He is our substitute. He's our champion. You see, our tendency is to look at passages of Scripture like this and, and to conclude, I need to, leave, I need to live like Jesus. I need to believe, I need, I need to behave like Jesus. I need to memorize scripture like Jesus did so that I can recite scripture when temptations come my way. I need to focus on the fact that every decision I make in some way is going to move me closer to either God's kingdom or Satan's kingdom. And I need to be moving toward God's kingdom. So I need to behave like Jesus behaved. But, but the bigger point is that the conflict, the battle, is not for our behavior. It's for our heart. It's for what we love. And merely following Jesus as your example will not change your heart. It'll change you outwardly, but it won't change you inwardly. Now, it can discourage you when you don't do well, when you say, all right, Jesus is my example, ready, go, and then I blow it. Well, that'll be discouraging. Or it might even make you arrogant. We talked about this a little bit last week. You know, you can say, all right, Jesus is my example, and I had a good day. Hey, hey, hey. look at me. I'm doing all right. But it won't change you. It won't make you into a new creation. Jesus isn't just our example. He's our substitute. Jesus passed the test. That's true. But he didn't pass the test to show us how to pass the test. 
Jesus passed the test in our place. He did it for us. This is what we need to understand about, about David and Goliath. I'll just kind of use this as an example to help us see how this really works. We might look at the story of David and Goliath in the Old Testament and how David you know, defeated Goliath with five smooth stones and a sling, right? And we, and we, look, we read that story, we hear about it, and we say, wow, David, the, the, the little guy, was, was able to slay the giant, and, and, and God helped him, and that's good. And so, like David, we need to slay giants. Ready? Let's become giant killers, all right? And we'll give you the seven principles for how to be a giant killer, and, and I'll teach you how to do it, and the Bible tells us how to do it, and we'll go kill giants. That's not really the point of David and Goliath. See, David wasn't an example to the Israelites. He was the Israelites. The way it happened was the Philistines and the Israelites came together, and they were about to have a war where everyone was going to die. So in, in wisdom, the, some of the leaders got together and said, how about this? Instead of all of us dying, why don't you pick one from your side and we'll pick one from our side and they'll fight each other mano a mano and, who, and whoever's hero or whoever's champion wins, that nation wins. And whoever's hero or champion loses, that nation loses. And they agreed. Now, it got a little bit dramatic when Goliath steps out and says, I'm ready, bring it. And in, on, the, on the Israel sides, it was crickets for days. And finally, David says, and this is worth mimic, this is, this is worth emulating, by the way, his faith. He says, we serve the God of the universe here, people. Is not one of us willing to trust God and step out in faith? Are we, are we living by sight or are we living by faith? Are we, are we going to fear the Philistines, and, and particularly this Philistine, more than we fear God, or are we going to fear God? And they're just looking at him going, uh, good talk. And David says, okay, it'll be me. I'll do it. And they put the coat of armor on him, and it didn't fit. He says, I'll, I'll just be better without it. And he goes out there, and, and it's, it's really miraculous, actually. It's not really David. David was willing to step forward. He was willing to do his thing. But it was God who did it. But the point is this. The, the, the moral of that story is, is not be like David. Mimic him. He's our example. He's our role model. No. The moral of the story is David won for them. Because David won, we win. And because Goliath lost, the Philistines were defeated. And the, defeat, the, the Philistines turned tail and ran. And the, and the Israelites said, we are the champions. Because their champion won. That's who Jesus is. Do you see that? He is not a role model. I mean, I'm not saying don't, don't, don't emulate him. We are called to be like him. In fact, God's Word tells us that He is in the process of making us like Him. But the power to capture our hearts is not in, look at Jesus as your example. The power to capture your heart is recognize that Jesus is you. When He lived, He lived for you. And when He died, He died for you. And when He was raised from the dead, you, who are trusting in Him, were also raised from the dead. Such that the old is gone and the new has come. That's who we are. Jesus passed the test. Not to show us how to pass. Jesus passed the test in our place. And then He went to the cross in our place. Not so that He might change our behavior. Yes, but not just that, but so that he might win our hearts, so that we wouldn't want anything without him. 
See, Satan says, here's all these shiny things, all these wonderful things. Don't you want them? And wouldn't you want them even without God? And what Jesus has done for us is, is trying to draw us in to say, yes, these things may be good, but they are not supreme. They are not what we live for. And they are not what we give our heart to. Our heart is with the Lord. That we wouldn't want any of those things without Him. And so here's the ultimate question. Do you want Him? Do you want Him? Such that if you could have Him but not have something else in this world that you desire, would you still want him? He's not a means to an end. The Lord is an end in himself. He is the prize. And that's what changes our hearts. When we, it's not just changing our behavior, it's changing us. Because our commitment and our love and our devotion goes to him. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet was without sin. And that without sin was in our place for us as our substitute. If I can paraphrase the writer of Hebrews... Let us then live before the throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you didn't merely send an example because if you had, we would have been doomed. Because the example of Jesus is greater than we could ever live up to. We can, never, we can never satisfy it. And if we were only acceptable to you based on our ability to emulate Jesus, none of us could stand. But we thank you, Lord, that it was not just an example that you sent and that you gave us but you lived in our place as our substitute, as our champion. And you passed the test. You lived a sinless life in our place so that in you we have passed the test. And then you took all of our shortcomings, all of our sins, and you went to the cross also as our substitute in our place. And you took the full just condemnation that our sin and we deserved. And now you are seated at the right hand of the Father and where you are, we are. When Christ who is your life appears, we appear with him. Lord, would you take these truths and not just change our behavior, but change our hearts. Capture our hearts that we would love you, that we would resist the temptations of this world and of the devil, not by sheer willpower, but because we would love you more than we love anything that this world can offer. And that we, we devote ourselves to you and trust you with regard to how we would relate to the things of this world because our devotion is to you. Lord, continue to work in us and shape our hearts that our lives might truly honor you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.